we are clearly convinced that this is very important, not only uh, for the planet, it's very important uh, for the future of mankind. Nations of the world united in this common cause, and the Paris Agreement was born. EU Parliament has voted to ratify the Paris Agreement on climate change. Nigeria signed the Paris Agreement on climate change. US President Donald Trump withdrew the United States from the Paris Climate Change Agreement. So what is the Paris Agreement on climate change? And why it's so important? Or is it important at all? Formally, the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, but the story of it started long time ago. Back in the 1986, Swedish scientist Svante Arrhenius first published the idea that burning fossil fuels can pump CO2 levels so significantly that humans can cause global warming. This was the very first time when the idea of human-caused climate change actually went public. But back then, no one paid attention to his statement, so time went by, and in 1930s, measurements showed that average temperature of US and northern Atlantic is increasing. But no one actually knew what the reason for that, maybe it's a natural cycle, maybe it's some regional climate event. At the same time, another scientist published his point of view, proving that those measurements already mean that climate change is underway. His name was Guy Stewart Callender. He was an English steam engineer and inventor who, out of pure curiosity, decided to dive into a completely new topic – climate science. In the early 1930s, Callender began collecting data on concentration and properties of the atmospheric gases, on the rainfalls and temperatures across the globe, on the role of the ocean currents and use of fossil fuels, as well as on many other factors. As a result, he produced the first ever graph of climate model, the mathematical model simulating climate behavior based on its core drivers. Even today, scientists say that his calculations were surprisingly accurate. But, as you can imagine, back then his research was not received too well. Members of meteorological society basically ignored his proofs and calculations, saying that a person with no relevant PhD could not be right on such a complex issue. But Callender never gave up on his theory and kept working on it till late 1960s, publishing more and more proofs. He became one of the most significant figures in discovery of climate change. Calendar's study raised quite a lot of curiosity towards the possibility of climate change in the scientific community, and other scientists also continued to look into the topic. And in the 1950s, this was the first time when more broad scientific community went public saying that we think climate change is really happening, we still don't know the reason, humans might be a reason, but we don't have proofs yet, but guys, something is definitely happening. Popularization and investigation of climate change continued on bigger scale now, but no concrete actions to fight it were taken till one notable moment. On June 23, 1988, James Hansen, one of the leading NASA scientists, gave testimony to the US Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. This testimony is considered to be the first call for action on the highest level. In his statement, he not only confirmed that according to NASA computer simulations, climate change is happening, but he also highlighted that climate change is already large enough to cause extreme weather events, and with 99% certainty it is caused by human actions. His statement made headlines around the world, and for the first time have started the real discussion between public, scientists, and politicians. As one of the measures, the United Nations established in the end of the same year organization called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that includes representatives from 195 countries whose goal is to have the most up-to-date information on the problem of climate change. Basically, they review almost every scientific information that is being produced in the world and build comprehensive picture based on those tons of reports. So what they do is actually tremendous work. And this organization became, let's say, a huge lever in pushing problem of climate change further, because now at least governments have a single source of truth, someone they can rely on in terms of trying to get more information on what's going on. The next important milestone happened in June 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit. It was a major international United Nations conference that brought together representatives from 179 countries to discuss plan of actions to be taken globally to minimize negative human impact on the environment. And for the first time in history, climate change became one of the major problems on agenda of such an event. 
At the result of the conference, there was signed a very important document that was basically a grand, grand, grand parent of the Paris Agreement. The document calls United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now let's check some key facts. As I mentioned, the document was signed in June 1992. It was ratified two years later. Ratified basically means that it entered into force. Because after the country signed the document, it has to approve it with the key government bodies of the country. For example, in case of US, this would be US Senate. In the end, 197 countries ratified the convention. The purpose of the document was to make sure that countries sign under the words that climate change is a problem, that countries have to consider actions to minimize their greenhouse gas emissions, and make sure that the reduction of emissions will be enough to keep us at safe level. But not all the countries necessarily had to take actions. It was decided that so far, only developed countries are under obligation to minimize their greenhouse gas emissions. First of all, because back then they were responsible for the much bigger share of emissions that are already accumulated in the atmosphere. And secondly, because they have more financial, technological and human resources to actually affect the problem. As for developing countries, it was decided that they can participate voluntarily if they want to. And if not, well, then they can do nothing so far. The convention also suggested the establishment of the financial mechanism to support developing countries in their fight with greenhouse gas emissions and with consequences of the climate change that they suffer from already. For example, most of African countries heavily rely on agriculture, and climate change already reshuffled the rainfall patterns. This brought much more floods and droughts into the regions. But to fight this, they need, for example, build much more resilient agricultural infrastructure. They also need to support regions in hunger caused by poor harvest. And to do this, they need financial resources that those countries do not have. For projects like that, it was decided to launch a system of grants and loans through the fund that will be replenished every four years by almost 40 developed countries. This approach represents one of the principles of climate justice, which states that those countries who have benefited from emissions in the form of ongoing economic development and increased wealth have an ethical obligation to share those benefits with countries who are today suffering from the effect of those emissions. To implement the convention, every country now had to develop the plan of actions to reduce their emissions, and they had to report on the results of those actions every year. But it's also important to notice that the convention was not legally binding. It means that countries didn't have any legal obligation to actually deliver on their commitments. But this was at least the first attempt to align countries on something more concrete than just idea of climate change. Five years later, after the Rio summit, in December 1997, countries signed the first extension to the convention. It was called the Kyoto Protocol. It was a little bit more concrete. It finally had at least some numeric goals. But probably exactly since the Kyoto Protocol was much more concrete, it was much harder to make countries implement it. And it took seven years to ratify the agreement. And by the time when it actually got ratified, it was already outdated. But let's go step by step. The protocol got ratified in February 2005. The first commitment period, which is the period when countries had to work towards achieving the objectives of the protocol, was from 2008 to 2012. This time, protocol got ratified by 193 countries. And unfortunately, US didn't join. And back at the time, US was number one greenhouse gas emitter in the world. It was responsible for almost 25% of the all greenhouse gas emissions globally. So what was the goal this time? It was very concrete. Developed countries under the protocol had to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 5% versus the level of 1990. The protocol had similar approach to defining the countries under obligation. It still binded on the developed countries with the commitment to decrease their emissions. And developing countries, again, could join this effort, but voluntarily. And this approach became one of the reasons why some people say that Kyoto Protocol was not really successful. First of all, because by 2005, some developing countries became really big emitters. China surpassed US in this sense. So without US joining, without developing countries like China and India having strong obligation to decrease their emissions, Kyoto Protocol protocol had quite little span of control. It was responsible for only 18% of global emissions, meaning that even if countries under obligation delivered on their commitments for 100% and other countries continue with no emissions reduction, global temperatures would still continue to rise. The second reason was that developed countries thought, well, okay, they're gonna look at our emissions and they're not gonna look for the emissions, for example, of Vietnam, many of African countries. So why not to transfer our most polluting industries, most polluting factories? 
least there. And that's exactly what started happening. So yeah, the approach didn't really pass the reality test. On the financial support of developing countries, I didn't really find any particular differences comparing to the convention, but on the implementation side, there were quite a few of them actually. Since now countries had very specific numeric goals, they had to establish credible national systems to track emissions and removals. To help them and to make results of those systems comparable across the countries, IEPCC created a common methodology for greenhouse gas inventories. As previously, countries had to report on the results once a year. Additional significant difference was in introduction of market mechanisms to help countries meet their reduction goals. So what is the market mechanism in this case? When countries set a limit on emissions, they create something of value, the right to emit. And this is something that can be sold and bought. Market mechanisms provide an opportunity to do this. There were three of them. The first one is international emissions trading. As you remember, there were two groups of countries under Kyoto Protocol. The first one is developed or industrialized, who had direct obligation to decrease their emissions. And the second is developing countries. And this mechanism is applicable only to the first group. So, how does it work? Let's imagine we have country A and country B. Country A got the target to decrease their emissions. But unfortunately, they were not able to meet the target by the amount highlighted with the set phase. Country B had the opposite situation. They also got the target, but they were able to surpass the target. It means that now country B has some spare emission units by which it exceeded the target. And country A, if it wants to, can buy those units to at least partially close its gap. The second one is clean development mechanism. And to me it seems much more fun, because it includes not only financial transaction of selling and buying emission units, but it also includes some real project, real physical projects. This time cooperation of both groups of countries is required. Let's imagine again we have developed country A and developing country X. In case developed country A is not meeting their goals, they can say, hmm, fine, if I cannot reduce greenhouse gases by the required amount within my country, then why not help other country decrease their greenhouse gas emissions? And those reductions will be included into my greenhouse gas inventory. And that's exactly what happens. Country A can invest in clean infrastructure project in country X, for example, build a wind farm or install solar panels. As a result, country X will decrease its greenhouse gas emissions, comparing to the scenario without the project. And those emission units country A now can include in their greenhouse gas inventories. And even though I really like the idea itself, but there were quite a few arguments regarding this mechanism. And the main argument was about the validity of the results. Emission units calculated for the project are theoretical ones, and it's quite hard to say if this project will actually decrease greenhouse gas by promised amount, which means it leaves some space for playing a numbers game. The last mechanism calls joint implementation. It works quite similar to the previous one, clean development mechanism, but this time projects are done within the group of developed countries only. Another major difference was that in case of Kyoto Protocol, commitments to reduce emissions were legally binding. Countries had legal obligation to deliver the results. And even though at first sight it sounds like a good idea if you want to achieve real results, but in reality, back then climate change was still not the first priority problem. And having legal obligation could force countries to abandon any involvement at all. And that's partially what happened. Kyoto Protocol had two phases. And the second phase was from 2013 to 2020. And second phase had to be much more aggressive. Now the goal was to reduce greenhouse gases by 18% versus 1990 level. And partially, exactly due to legal binding obligations, this time less countries got involved. Only 29 developed countries and the European Union decided to continue participate in implementation of the protocol. But despite all its shortcomings, the Kyoto Protocol was a huge step forward in the field of international cooperation to combat climate change, and lessons learned became the basis for a new, upgraded, improved agreement. In 2015 happened the meeting in Paris, and the result of the meeting was the Paris Agreement that this video actually dedicated to. The agreement was signed in December 2015 and ratified one year later. The first commitment period started in 2020, and review of the results expected to be done every five years. This time, agreement got ratified by 190 countries. Later, US withdrew from the agreement, but is likely to rejoin soon enough. So, what's about the goal this time? It said, guys, we have to make sure that global temperature will not be increased by more than 2 degrees Celsius 
and better if we actually make an extra effort and keep it below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And we have to achieve a point of net zero emissions by 2015, which means that amount of greenhouse gas emissions produced had to become equal to amount of greenhouse gas emissions taken out of the atmosphere by natural means like trees or oceans or by human introduced technologies. Lessons of the Kyoto Protocol were learned very well, and now all parties were under obligation to decrease their emissions, both developing and developed countries. Level of commitment varies, of course, but nevertheless, all countries now are under commitment to decrease their emissions. On financial support, I didn't find major differences versus the Kyoto Protocol, except that now there is a numeric goal, $100 billion investments a year, and not only developed countries can become the donor, but also others can join if they want to. On the implementation side, things also changed quite dramatically. Instead of setting top-down legally binding goals, as it was done within the Kyoto Protocol, now the focus is on flexibility and national ownership. Now countries can set their own targets, consistent with their level of development and technological advancement, to make it work, to allow countries be flexible on their targets, and still at the same time to meet an overarching goal of the agreement, it was decided to focus on processes and make them even more robust than before, even more aligned than before, even more transparent transparent and even more comparable between the countries. In this case, countries cannot put absolutely random figures in their national plans, because it's gonna be obvious, but except of just fact checks, it gives much better mechanism for cooperation between the countries and sharing their learnings, best practices, technological and business solutions. In case you guys for some reason need to know in more details how the implementation works and how those processes work, I highly recommend to check the Paris rulebook. This is exactly the set of guidelines on how implementation of the agreement is done. Additionally, over 280 scientists from IPCC helped to prepare an updated methodology for greenhouse gas inventories based on latest science. And there are also improvements in market mechanisms. The thing is, I haven't found like major methodological differences in mechanisms comparing to the Kyoto Protocol, but from my understanding, there is at least an effort to improve those mechanisms based on the loadings done. And of course, one more major difference is that now commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions are not legally binding. There are some legal obligations to establish emissions tracking systems and conduct regular reporting, but to actually deliver on the results and comply with the targets that countries calculated for themselves, there is no legal obligation. So let's get back to the question, is the Paris Agreement important? Well, no matter how scary it is to admit that climate change is happening and that this time it's not just natural cycle, it's the direct result of our actions. Unfortunately, scientists already proved this a century ago and from year to year they only reconfirmed initial conclusions. To combat this threat, all nations will have to demonstrate the greatest integrity and cooperation ever shown. And the Paris Agreement so far is the only mechanism to achieve this. And I'm talking not only about the paper itself, but also about the effort it represents. So it actually has an existential value for millions of species, including us. So guys, thanks for watching. If you liked it, don't forget to put your like and to subscribe and to do whatever you do with a normal YouTube channel. Thanks guys and see you soon.